Didn't we have a great time last week? It's a great time in the house of God. Last Sunday in both services combined, we had 2,054 in attendance. It's a broke all attendance records that we've ever had. We thank God for that. But the most important thing was in the combined services, we had approximately 300 people come forward and give their lives to Jesus. So I hope you give God praise for that. That was awesome. Okay, people beginning their journey. By the way, let me just share with you, I failed to do this at 9 o'clock, but um, tomorrow at 12 noon, I'll be doing a live Bible study on Facebook. Go to the church's Life Source Church's Facebook page, like the page, and then tune in with us. I'll be doing a live Bible study from here, from this campus, as I share with you the word of the Lord. And then it's done at 12 o'clock. It goes about 20 minutes, 30 minutes max. And then we upload it. So if you happen to miss the lunchtime Bible study at 12 noon live, that you can pick it up later. And make sure that you share that with your friends. Just, just get it out there. This past Monday, there was a strong anointing on the Bible study, and I talked about the journey. Because so many people on Easter Sunday had begun a journey, but every single one of us are in a journey. Okay? And I talked about that, and I won't get into that. It's uploaded. You can watch it if you want and share that with some people. But I hope to get you tuning in live tomorrow at 12 noon. And while I'm teaching along the right sidebar of the screen, I'm seeing comments and questions that people are sending to me live. So I try to address them and recognize them as we're going along. But today we enter a new series called The Table. It's after the resurrection and it's something that just captivated me, and I'll tell you about that in just a minute. But let's go to Luke 24. Luke 24, there's this story of these two disciples, and they're on the road to Emmaus, okay? And they're really troubled. They haven't grasped yet the resurrection of what has happened and what's taken place. All they know is their master, their teacher, their savior is, has been crucified, and they're walking along, and they're really troubled, and on the journey coming alongside of them is Jesus, and they don't recognize that it's him. Now here, these are two of his disciples, okay? Did you know that sometimes Jesus can come alongside of you, and you're not even aware of it? So he's walking alongside of them, and he hears them talking, and he's saying, what, what are you... What's going on, you know? And, and, and their response is, are you a stranger that you don't know what's taking place here in Jerusalem? And he, he says, well, what happened? So they began to tell him about him, what happened to him, as if he didn't know what happened to him. So then Jesus, he, he, he then, in his conversation, he begins to expound to them the scriptures from Moses through the Old Testament of all the things that should happen to Christ. And we pick up the story in verse number 28. If you're in Luke 24, if you don't have your Bibles, you can look up on the screen and you'll see it. And they're getting close to the village where they are staying, and Jesus indicates that he's going to keep going. Like, you know, he's going to keep walking. But they're insistent of him, and they say, why don't you stay with us? The hour is late. Come to our house. And so Jesus acquiesces, and um, he goes in to stay with them, okay? Then the next verse says, Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them. Now this phrase, sat at the table, could be more correctly rendered that he reclined at the table. Because in biblical days, they weren't sitting up at tables like you and I sit at tables. They were low tables to the floor and pillows around and they just reclined at the table you know and he's reclining at the table with them and he takes the bread and he breaks it and he blesses it and he gives it to them okay look at the next verse then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight as soon as they get the revelation, and before they could get it out of their mouths, hey, this is, he's gone. Okay, now, now look what happens. 
they said to one another, didn't our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road? Can I tell you something? That when you experience Jesus, something is going to happen internally here. Something is going to take place on the inside of your soul and on the inside of your mind that's going to be amazing. You'll have feelings that you hadn't felt before. And it happened while he opened the scriptures to them. Now watch this. Look at the next. So they rose up that very hour. They returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11. And those who were with them gathered. Now here are the disciples. They're all gathered together. And they said, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road. And how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Listen to that carefully. He was known to them when? The breaking of bread. The breaking of the bread brought revelation to them. All right? Now, as they said these things, Jesus comes and he stands in the midst of them. And he says to them, peace to you. Next verse. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Now watch this. This is so cool. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. Okay? Look at me. Come, feel me, touch me. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Got anything to eat? Any food around here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he ate, broke it, and ate in their presence. Now before we pray, I just want you to see this really, really, really carefully today. There's something powerful that happens at the table that we cannot miss, okay? Father, today as we come before you, we do so humbly in the name of Jesus. Come on, pray with me, church. Father, let there be something that happens inside of us like those two on the road to Emmaus that their hearts burn within them. God, let something wonderful take place on the inside of us. Let something wonderful transpire here today. Let something wonderful happen among us and in us today as we sit at the table and as we recognize the life of Jesus and what he did. I pray, oh God, that you would open our eyes as you open their eyes. Open our eyes that, God, we may see as we need to see. Open our eyes, God, that we may see the truths of your scriptures, of your word. And God, I pray that above everything else, Jesus Christ would be lifted high. Jesus Christ would be exalted. Jesus Christ would be magnified. For it's in his precious holy name that we pray. And let everybody say amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated. So here, in the breaking of bread, their eyes are open. Right? Breaking of bread, their eyes are open. And then Jesus comes to the disciples, and he shows them everything. Hands, show, see, it's me. I'm the one talking. See, look, it's me. And then he asks them, do you have any food here? It's time to eat. It's time to break bread. Now, why did Jesus do that? I would submit to you that Jesus is wanting, wants the disciples to see Something supernatural happens at the table. It happened when he broke bread with the two on the road to Emmaus, right? When they got to the house and they reclined. Something supernatural took place, right? Something supernatural happened when we just prayed, right? These tables appeared behind me that weren't here before. Wow, what an amazing thing. Now, let me tell you about the inspiration for this for this message, okay? A couple of years ago, I was at a conference called Synergy. It was in Orlando, Florida. Pastor Josh and Lauren were with my wife and me. And at the conference, there was a gentleman who spoke. His name was Leonard Sweet. Anybody ever heard of Leonard Sweet? Okay, you need to know this guy. Leonard Sweet is a contemporary theologian who really has some pretty neat 
thoughts and teaching about things. He's kind of out there on the edge, but he speaks in a language that, um, that you and I would understand. He doesn't speak in these lofty theological terms. So he's teaching about the table, and that's where I got the inspiration for the message. And then he wrote a book called From Tablet to Table that I want to encourage you to purchase and read. You can download it if you want to on your tablet or device so that you can read it there. I have it on my device or get, get the book if you want it. But his premise for this teaching on the table that I want to share with you today and that comes from his book is simply this, that in the very beginning of creation, okay, in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 16, some of the first words out of God's mouth are these, eat freely. You can eat of all the trees except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but eat freely. And then Leonard says, at the end of the Bible, in Revelation 22, verse number 17, God in essence says, and I'm just summarizing what he says in this verse, he says, drink freely. If you're thirsty, come. Drink. You can drink. So Leonard says this, in the very beginning, Genesis 2.16, God says eat freely. In the very end, Revelation 22.17, God says drink freely. And between eat freely and drink freely, everything's a table in the scriptures. Now in the weeks to come, I'm going to show you through the scriptures what the Bible has to say about the table. And you will be amazed, amazed at what the scriptures say concerning the the table, okay? But let, let it suffice to say, let me, it's to, just to say this to you. We in the Western culture and Western world have lost the dynamics and the essence of the table. You know, when I grew up, I grew up in a nuclear family. What does that mean? We were ready to explode? No. What that means is that it was a normal, quote unquote, father, mother, children, right? doesn't get any plainer than that, okay? And so in my house, my dad went to work. My mom was staying home, okay? So when I got up in the morning, I would go downstairs, and my mom, she'd have cream of wheat, you know? Some of you don't even know what cream of wheat is. Cream of what? Cream of wheat and, you know, or she'd have some pancakes or she'd have some French toast or She'd have something for me for breakfast, right? And she made my lunch, and then I'd carry my lunch to school, okay? And then when I'd come home, you know, I'd go out to play. I'd ride my bike, do whatever outside. And then when my dad got home from work, we all sat down at the table and had dinner. That was a regular occurrence. I don't even remember going out to eat at a restaurant as a kid. I don't ever remember that. We always ate together as a family. But then, you know, I grew up in that culture that kind of changed and shifted, right? And to where now families are fractured and things are all over the place and people have schedules and busy and they're going running here and running to do that. So, so the, the table is like a drive through thing. That's why we have fast food, right? Fast food. Fast food, fast fat food. For you to drive through, them to throw your meal out into your car, and you to just consume it while you're on the road having no table time with anyone. As a matter of fact, it is said, statistics, and I've got a ton of them that I'll be sharing with you in weeks to come, but the one I want to share with you this morning is that on average, the average time spent at the table for a meal in America is 12 minutes. 12 minutes. Because it's not about the experience. We in the Western world have lost the experience of the meal. You know, one of the, uh, ex uh, a, a great trip that I had one time with some friends um, is going to Italy. And I remember when we, we were visiting certain towns, they would have these large piazzas, not pizzas, piazzas. The pizzas are pretty huge too. But these big open 
squares where people gather together and usually restaurants are lined around and people in that culture they would just come out and they would sit there for two hours just soaking up the sun eating outside and enjoying one another's presence engaging in conversation but My goal in sharing with you this message today and the messages in the weeks to come is to get us to reclaim the table here in the West, at least here at Life Source International Church, for you to see the value of it from a scriptural standpoint, but then also hopefully through some teaching and talking, a sociological standpoint as well, the need for us to spend time with one another at the table. Now, today I'm going to just simply focus on the life of Jesus And we're going to see that there were five tables in his ministry. There are others, but I'm going to focus on these five real quickly with you for you to understand the importance of the table in the life of Jesus. Now, before I do that, let me just talk about Jesus as a person for a moment, okay? Because just like Leonard Sweet says, the beginning of Scripture, Genesis 2, and the end of Scripture, Revelation 22 is about eat freely, drink freely, and everything a table in between. The very beginning of the life of Jesus is a table, and the very end of it is a table, and everything in in the middle is a table as well, okay? And I'll prove it to you. I just proved it to you at the very end, because after he was resurrected, right, and he talks about the table, okay? Next week, I'm going to share with you another scripture out of out of John 21 that'll show it even again, okay, post-resurrection. When I first came to the Lord, many of you know I wasn't brought up in church, never attended a church service till I was a young man, didn't know anything about church, but when I first came, they used to sing an old song uh, in in church called Come and Dine. Does anybody know that song? Okay. How many of you don't know that song? Look at you. Look around at all the deprived people here. The sanctuary there. Come and die. It's a great song. Okay? Kind of goes like this. Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people. Come and dine. With his manna he doth feed, and supplies our every need. Oh, tis sweet to sup with Jesus all the time. Chorus, come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry calleth now, come and dine. Come back next week for verse number two and the chorus again, okay? And you'll get the rest of that. But the song has some really deep meaning concerning the table, right? Come and dine. The master calls, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time, right? All the time. So here, Jesus comes to this earth. We read in John chapter 6, beginning at verse number 32, right? Jesus says to the crowd, Who's gathered there, John 6, 32. He says to them, For surely I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Right? And who's he speaking of, right? The true bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now, the people respond. They say, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus responds to that and says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will not thirst. I want want you to focus on the phrase that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He's the bread of life. And I want to tell you something, folks. This world is hungry. This world is thirsty. You can see it because they try to do everything they can in this world to get satisfied, but they never get satisfied. They try drugs. They try alcohol. They try sex. They try amusement. They try to get wealthy. They try everything that they can in this world, and it always leaves them 
not satisfied. Jesus is the bread of life who satisfies every being who will come to him and receive him. He said, I am the bread of life. Now, when Jesus was born, we read it in Luke chapter 2, he was born in the city of what? Where was he born, folks? No, not New York. He was born in Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, okay? And because there was no local hotel that had any openings in Bethlehem, the only place he could go to and his family could go to was a barn, And Mary gave birth to Jesus in a barn. And when Jesus was born, they didn't have any place to put him, so they laid him in a what? Manger. Now, the word manger in the original language means feeding trough. He was laid in a feeding trough, an animal feeding trough. Okay? Now, I don't think that there are any coincidences with God. I think there's a divine order to things and purpose behind everything. There's a reason Jesus was born in Bethlehem. You want to know what it is? Well, it's because he's of the lineage of David, sure. But the name Bethlehem means house of bread. And Jesus is laid in a feeding trough symbolizing that he would feed not only his family who was gathered in the barn, not only the shepherds who came to announce his birth, not only the wise men who came from the east, but Jesus would be the bread of heaven that would feed every hungry soul and every hungry life in this entire world. Amen? Amen. Jesus came to be broken, to be fed. So he could feed the world. And I'm here to say to you today, just like Jesus did in the Gospel of John chapter 7, are you hungry? Then come and eat of the Master. Are you thirsty? Then come and drink of the water of life freely, and you'll never thirst again. In other words, you'll be fully satisfied. Fully satisfied. And this is why Jesus came. Now, we look at the ministry of Jesus. There are five tables. They're represented up here. The first table that we come to in the life of Jesus, it is the table of acceptance. The table of acceptance. And it's found in Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 to 13. We find Jesus, in in that passage of Scripture, reclining at a table. And the Bible says that many tax collectors and sinners were gathered to him. And the Pharisees, though, they asked him, they asked his disciples, said, why is it that your teacher eats with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus heard them say that, okay? He heard them say, ask that question. And he said to them, Those who are well don't need a physician, except those who are sick. He said, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Now, why did Jesus say that? Because the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they were all about sacrifices, 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 and they were very, very low on justice and mercy. Okay? And then Jesus went on to say after that, he said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now understand the ministry and the mission of Jesus. Here he is reclined at a table, and who's around him at the table? Sinners, tax collectors, the undesirable of society. Why? Because with Jesus, his table was a table of acceptance. He accepted people who they were. They could come and eat with the master. They didn't have to stand in line outside. They could come and sit down and recline at the table with him, and Jesus received them all. Come. Come as you are. Come. Come, no matter what your background. Come, no matter what your sins are. Come, no matter how you've dishonored or disobeyed God. Come, sit down and eat with me. It was a table of acceptance, and I just want to say to you, church of the living God today, may you and I provide tables of acceptance to the world. 
May we provide tables of acceptance for people to come and eat. Okay, I know what some of you religious people are saying who know the Bible. You say, well, what about that guy in 1 Corinthians that Paul said you shouldn't eat with? You know, the difference is this. The reason Paul said don't eat with that guy is because he was a professing brother. He was professing Christianity. He was professing to be a believer, but he was sleeping with his father's wife. He said, There's n- that's not even done among the heathen and the pagans out there. So he said, don't even eat with that so-called brother as a sign of discipline from the church. So what did they do? They really slammed this guy, man. You go read 2 Corinthians, and Paul comes back and says, look, look, okay, enough is enough. You know, the guy's repentant. He's come back. That was the whole idea, right? So don't think that because Paul said in 1 Corinthians, don't eat with this guy because not, not because he was sinner, but he, because he was a brother who was unrepentant of his sins. Jesus is saying, break bread with the world. Break bread with sinners. Sit down at the table, church of the living God. Sit down and have a meal with those that are the unlikelies, those that, are, that, w- that the religious people would snub their nose at, those, those who are the unlikelies of, of, of society, right? Amen? I don't know about you, but before I got saved, I don't know too many people that had meat for dinner. But thank God, Jesus has a table of acceptance, and so should we. The next table that we read about is in Matthew chapter 26, verses 6 and 7. It's the table of anointing. There's a woman who comes to Jesus, and where is Jesus? The Bible says he's reclining at a home. He's at the table again. And while he's at the table, a woman comes in who breaks open a flat, an alabaster flax of oil and pours it on him in which Jesus said, listen, what this woman is doing is preparing me, preparing me for my burial. She is anointing my body for burial. And I just want to say to you, listen, folks, Jesus' table is a table of anointing. What happens to the master flows on his guests. If you will sit at the table with the master, you will receive of his anointing. That's why you and I shouldn't be too quick at the table. We ought to sit down and enjoy it. Listen, the table is a place of eating and meeting and seating and feeding. And you ought to enjoy every morsel that is presented at the table. We need to adorn our tables a little bit better. We need to have feasts at our tables so we can sit and enjoy. It's something meant to be enjoyed, to sit down and relax. That's why I love the biblical picture of reclining at the table. It's getting in a relaxed posture, not to just hurry up and Some people are even standing up and eating. They're just shoveling it in, just standing up to move on, to go to the next thing. By the way, let me bring you something else to do at your table, okay? And I'm tempted with this. When I'm sitting at the table, I've got my phone. I'm getting text messages, and I'm checking things out. You know, I want to have a rule at the table where I sit. Put all cell phones away. Put them down. There's a time for everything. And that's not the time. If you're that important, you must be the President of the United States. You are way too important. Okay? Put that thing down. How many of you have ever been at a restaurant and you've looked over, you watched two people, and they're just sitting there on their phones? They're not even looking at each other, not even talking. As a matter of fact, I have become convinced that some of them are just texting each other at the table. <laughs> they're, not even, they're not even talking. They're not even communicating. Okay? And that seems to be going on the whole time, right? And we're missing some exchange. We're missing the anointing. 
that's present at the table if we will allow it to flow. The anointing that's talked about in Psalm 133 where people dwell together in unity, people dwell together in oneness, then the anointing is released. It flows down top of Aaron's head and beard, and I could go into all that. But hear me, just hear me today. The table is a table of anointing, and you and I need to enjoy that. Then as we move along, we find the table of forgiveness. This is in Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse number 36 through verse number 50, okay? It's an expansion of the Matthew 26 story. It's the same woman who comes as Jesus is doing what? What do you think Jesus is doing? Take a look here real quick. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. Look at this. Jesus didn't say, no, you're a Pharisee. You're a religious hypocrite. I'm not about to come and eat with you. Oh, Jesus said, oh, free meal, man, I'm in. Let's go. Let's do this. So he comes to the Pharisee's house, and he sits down to eat. Now, remember, sit down means to recline. He's reclining to eat, and behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner. Here she comes, okay? She found out Jesus is at this house, and she comes in. You know what? Here again, let me just give you another picture of this. Our homes are different today than they were years ago, decades ago. I remember my my dad who, my dad grew up in Hamden. He grew up in 23rd Street, okay, in the city. And my dad used to tell me stories about when he was a kid on 23rd Street. It'd be like all of the homes were open, front doors and back doors. He'd tell stories about them running through the neighborhood. And he told this story one time about... Somebody was chasing them. I, if I'm not mistaken, it was the police, I think. And they were chasing my dad and his friends, and they were just running, they were just running through the front, they, running up the street, 23rd Street, and they cut into a friend's house. And they're running through the front of the house by the kitchen, and the family's just sitting there eating, eating their meal. And the father says, how's it going, boys? And they just keep flying out the back door into the alley. And boom, then they're gone. And it's just like homes in those days, they were just open. Front door open, back door open. Now you've got to close your door, latch it four times, set the alarm code, make sure nobody breaks in and busts in and does something. It's crazy, right? And it's kind of an open scenario that we see here in Luke chapter 7. This woman hears that Jesus is at this house and she just shows up. She comes in and same as Matthew 26, she breaks open this alabaster flask of oil, pours it on it. But Luke expounds on this more so. And it says, as Luke records it, that this woman wept with her tears, and her tears poured over the feet of Jesus, and she took her hair and used it as a towel to wipe his feet. Now listen, folks. I know that most of us probably have this really serious concept of Jesus, how he looked and what he did. Some people just see this Rabbi teacher just walking along, okay? Remember, dusty roads in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. His feet were not clean. They were dusty and dirty. Jesus, I know this is going to surprise some of you, he perspired. There are probably some times where, you know, John, what is it, the shortest verse in the Bible is John 7, 35, Jesus wept. We could add another verse in there sometimes. Jesus stank. See, some of us don't want to think of that way. Some of us don't want to think about Jesus where he goes, like he comes to the, after the resurrection, he comes to, his, comes to his disciples and says, hey, got any food here? Let's eat. But this is Jesus. And his feet were not clean. And when those tears came down upon Jesus' feet, it cleaned off the dirt and the dust 
that he had collected as he was walking along. And the woman's hair was used as a towel that probably got really dirty and had mud on it after she wiped all that stuff off of his feet. And the people who were around, they were amazed. They couldn't believe that Jesus was allowing this woman to do this to him. So he says to the, to the owner of the house, the host, because he knows that this Pharisee's got an issue with what's going on. He says, Simon, let me ask you something. You know, when I came into your house, how come you didn't wash my feet? I'm a guest here. How come you didn't treat me as a guest? How come you didn't take care of me? But no, this woman who is a sinner, okay, comes in as a stranger from outside, and she does more for me as a sinner than the host of this house. And then he turns to this woman, and here's the table that I want to tell you about. He turns to the woman and says, woman, your sins are forgiven you. Forgives her of her sins, and the people are astonished. Can I tell you, every one of you today who are gathered here at Life Source International Church, and those of you who are watching this webcast, if you're living in sin today, I want you to know that Jesus has a table of forgiveness where he invites you to come and break bread with him, and he will forgive you for every sin you've ever committed in your life. Amen? Amen. Thank God for the table of forgiveness. But hear me today, folks. You as the church of the living God, need to also have tables of forgiveness in this world. Amen? Hey, listen, it's April, right? The weather's supposed to be breaking, although when you got up this morning, you wouldn't think so, as dastardly cold as it is outside and the wind blowing like crazy, and you look at the forecast, and it's supposed to get down to 27 degrees this week at night. But let's face it, it's going to break, right? Right? It's time to have some Holy Ghost barbecues. Amen? It's time to have some tables of tailgating and inviting the neighbors and the friends. And it's time to get with the people you love. It's time to get together as the body of Christ and have a table of forgiveness where you invite the world to come. Oh, yeah, they may bring stuff with them that you wouldn't participate with. Have them come anyway. Come on. Amen? Bring your own stuff and let's party. Let's come together and let's break bread and I'll show you Jesus. I'll show you the love of Jesus. I'll show you the forgiveness of Jesus. I'll show you the mercy of Jesus. Because so far in his ministry, we've seen a table of acceptance, a table of anointing, and a table of forgiveness. But the reason you need to have the tailgate parties and you need to have the barbecues is because of this table. It's called the table of evangelism. Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Again, Jesus is seen at a table in this passage of Scripture. And the Bible says that all the tax collectors and sinners, they were gathered to him because they were happy to hear him. They wanted to listen to what he said. So hear me, church. Hear me today. Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. How do you do that? Well, here we have some teams that they go out during the week and they go out in the city and they just do street evangelism and they do that. We have another team that's going out and they're doing sidewalk Sunday school and they're going into neighborhoods and they're ministering to the children and the families. Okay? But there's not one way only to do evangelism. There's not one way only to reach people. Jesus used the table. Jesus used a place of eating as a table of evangelism. And listen, turn your barbecues and turn your tailgates into places of evangelism. Okay? While you're feeding up barbecue spare ribs, feed up Jesus. Amen? While you're feeding up the hot dogs and the, and the stuff on the grill, by the way, oh my goodness, while you're grilling, do this, okay? Cut up some veggies. Take some small potatoes, cut them up, roast them. Roasted potatoes, right? Cut up those small potatoes. Take peppers and onions. And then take some olive oil and put in all kinds of spices, whatever you can. And then put all that chicken sausage and roasted potatoes and vegetables and mix it up all in that. And then put it in some aluminum foil and grill it for 20 minutes. Oh, my goodness. 
And while you're serving that up too, serve up the bread of life from heaven. Amen. Serve up Jesus Christ, the bread of life, the Savior of all mankind. Okay, the lover of sinners who takes away the sin of the world. Can you say amen? amen. The last bread I want to share with you today, John chapter 13. Now this bread is a complicated bread. Although this bread smells really good. This is all real bread up here, by the way. I've got flour all over my hands. Boy, does that smell good. You know what? It's garlic. I can smell it. Mmm. Oh, makes me want to break it open right now. This bread is complicated because in John 13, we have the bread of teaching and discipleship. We have the bread of serving but we also have the bread of treachery. John 13, verses 1 through 4. Jesus is with his disciples. It's called the Last Supper. Different from what we do. You know, what we do here is we've got a cup and we've got a wafer. How many of you know that it's different back then? Okay. As a matter of fact, Leonard Sweet, when he talks about the Passover, remember, he's a contemporary theologian, he says that when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he said the this that Jesus was talking about was not the communion itself, but was the table. Do the table in remembrance of me. Every time you're at the table, let the bread represent my body. Let the drink represent my blood. Let every table experience be done in remembrance of me. Amen? I like that. As a matter of fact, every table, you should offer prayer. If you're having a tailgate party with sinners, if you're having a barbecue with the world, why don't you stop and say, hey, just for a minute, we're going to pray. And just pray. Listen, I've had lunches, I've had dinners with people, business people, people who were lost, people who were in sin, but I still prayed. Why? Because I'm going to honor God. I'm going to thank him for the food that he's prepared for me. I'm going to thank him that he's given me some sustenance. And while I'm at it, I'm going to pray, Lord, let Jesus be seated at this table with us. Amen? See, when you pray, you invite heaven to visit. Let heaven visit your tables. So here's Jesus. He's reclining with his disciples and the Bible says after supper, he gets up, takes his garments aside, and he begins to what? He, he, what does he do? He washes the disciples' feet. He's giving them a lesson about serving at the table. And I would, I would put this out to you that when we talk about Jesus being the bread of life and him coming to the end of his ministry, the most important lesson that he would leave his disciples with would be the last one at the Last Supper. And it's a lesson, don't forget to serve. Don't forget to serve. Okay? So, after he does that, you go down to John 13, verse number 12. Then Jesus comes back to recline at the table with his disciples. He says... Do you know what I've done to you? And then he takes the table experience and he utilizes it as a moment for teaching and discipling and mentoring. Praise God, man. Turn your meals into moments of mentoring, discipleship, training. Okay? While you're sitting there with your kids... Mentor them a little bit. Talk about the things of life. Engage with them. Let it be some life exchange of what's going on. Okay? Then we go down to verse 27. Here's where the treachery comes. The Bible says that after Judas took the bread, Satan entered his heart. You know what that tells me about the bread? What it tells me about the table? That the table is a place for openness and transparency. And whatever you open yourself up to is what's going to enter you. Okay? When you sit at a table and you're not in a hurry and you're ready to do life together, there are some great things that can enter you. 
Remember what the disciples said on the road to Emmaus. Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us? That wasn't indigestion. They didn't need Prilosec or Tums. That was the fire of God burning inside of them. Oh, may the fire of God visit our tables again and burn within us that we may hear the voice of the master. Jesus has a table of mentoring and teaching. But watch what you open up yourself to. You see, this is why it's so good to have a table of acceptance and a table of anointing and a table of forgiveness. Because when you eat with sinners, oh, they don't know what they're opening themselves up to. When they get around your table, they don't know what's waiting them. Amen? So listen, this month, here's what I want to encourage you to do here at Life Source International Church. When service is over, don't be so quick to run out the door. Take some time to linger in the hall. Say to somebody, hey, let's get a cup of coffee. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the scriptures. Let's talk about what God's doing. Just have time to interact with one another. Listen, that mother that came this morning whose son was murdered Thursday night came to the 9 o'clock service. She needed a hug. She needed somebody to hold her. She needed somebody to pray with her. But she also needs a meal. She needs somebody to sit down at a table with her. And give her Jesus. And let Jesus heal her heartache. And let Jesus calm her storm. And let Jesus minister peace to her soul. And how many people, folks, do you and I know out in this world, okay, who are broken, who are hurting, and they just need a meal. Because so many things, great things can happen when you just sit down and say, let's eat together. Let's break bread together. Would you stand with me, please, all over this building? Let me close with one last scripture to you, with you. Comes down to the end of Jesus' ministry, right? Some of the last words from the life of Jesus, not in the Gospels, but rather it's in the book of Revelation. John is on the Isle of Patmos. He's getting instructions about the future and the things to come. He's supposed to write these letters to churches. And... Jesus says to John in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens the door, I will come in. And what? I will sup with him and he with me. Isn't that interesting? We look at that scripture as salvation right we've used that before salvation call Jesus will knock at your heart's door he'll knock at your life's door and he wants to come in but when he comes in he says let's eat let's have a meal together because I'm gonna give you something that's much better than what you've been eating I'm gonna give you something to drink that's much more satisfying than what you've been drinking It'll satisfy you. It'll minister to you. And in the mind of Jesus, hear me, the salvation experience is about a meal. I love that. I love that picture. In the weeks to come, I'm going to expound scriptures to you about this that will just amaze you. There's still more in the Gospels, more in in in, in in the scriptures. But hear me today. Jesus is knocking at your door. He wants to spend time with you. He wants to eat with you. He wants you to eat with him. Open up your heart. This month, month of April, I want to ask everybody here, spend time eating with somebody else in this congregation. Invite somebody to go out to eat, whether you have them at home, whether you eat somewhere. Listen, can I tell you something? There are some families that can have a table spread magnificently and nothing happen. There are other people that can sit down at a Big Mac and French fries and and have a table experience. Not that I would suggest that for healthy eating whatsoever. Did you hear what I'm saying? We've got to look past what's on the table and understand the experience of the table. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But boy, when you mix that with some good bread 
that you can dip in some olive oil with some pepper and some salt and some spices. Don't even let me go there. Woo! Father, today we love you. We thank you that you have given us the bread from heaven. Father, today I present to this congregation a table of acceptance, a table of anointing, a table of forgiveness, a table of evangelism, a table of teaching and mentoring and training, a table of openness, a table that you invite us to come to share with you. Let us share that bread with this world that lives would be forever changed in Jesus' holy name. Listen, here's how I want to close today. You know, last week, we gave an altar call in the second service here, an altar call for salvation. People came forward, gave their lives to Jesus, a couple hundred did. I could give an altar call today for healing. People come down, I lay hands on people for them to be healed. Give an altar call for deliverance. Today I'm giving another altar call. You know what it is? Go eat. Go to the table. Sit down. Minister to one another. But before you leave, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to pray for each other because I believe there's ministry that's out here in this congregation today. I just feel it differently every week. But today, if you need Jesus, he's the bread. Ask him for forgiveness. Ask him to come into your life. Ask him to come in. And he will. He's knocking at the door. If you need healing, I felt a strong healing anointing here all morning, all day today. The Lord can heal you today in this service. Those of you watching the webcast, join us in prayer. But I want to ask you to turn around in groups of three or four, no more than five. Just And this is going to be the close today. I want you to pray for each other. But before you pray, watch this. See, we're so quick to just join hands and start praying. But somebody asked the question, what can we pray for? Okay. What can we pray for? Because there are needs out here today. So look at each other before you pray. Say, what do you need? What can we pray for? And begin to pray for each other and minister to one another. When you're finished praying, service is over for you. Then you can go out. But when you go out, spend some time with each other, okay? May God bless you. I hope to see you tomorrow night from 7 to 8 here for prayer. Pray for each other before you go. Do that, okay? Right now, turn. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus.